<laughs> oh, hey there crafters and crafting fans, welcome to Holler and Craft. My name is Sean and in this video we'll be talking about how I made the Inferno Lamp in Final Fantasy XIV. Wait, one second, hold on. Mm. Mm. Man, really need to finish this thing at some point. So, in this video, we'll be talking about my newest project, making the Inferno Lamp from Final Fantasy XIV. I've been wanting to build this thing for a very long time, but to get a little backstory, let's head upstairs real quick. So, last year, we bought our first house. Um, nothing big or fancy, but, you know, it's ours. And we had spent most of that time remodeling, renovating, uh, contractors, you name it. It was all last year. But the living room was missing something. We did put up this really cool wallpaper though, but the wall's still kind of bare. At our old place, we had this giant mural that I had painted way over 10 years ago of a pyramid head from Sound Hole 2. So we're always kind of used to having a gamer centerpiece on our living room wall. So that's what we'll be doing today. We're gonna put a gamer piece right there. The Inferno Lamp is a craftable housing item from Final Fantasy XIV, and a very old one at that. Almost all the primals in Final Fantasy XIV drop crafting items to make housing items, but Ifrit's is by far the coolest. To make the Inferno Lamp in game, the first thing you need is to kick Ifrit's butt, and then take his horns. Then you just need a few common items, a couple nuggets, frosted buns, some candles, and of course, you need some fire crystals. From there, you just take your trusty hammer and just smash it all together. And voila, the Inferno Lamp is done. But to make this in real life, it's a little bit harder than that. Originally, I was going to freehand this whole project, but while gathering reference material, I found a 3D model of the Inferno Lamp on Thingiverse.com, and I thought I had the best reference material with this 3D model. But then I had a realization. I could put that 3D model into Peppacore Designer and make a template out of it. There was just two problems. One, I only had the free version of the software, and two, I've never made a template before. Well, $40 and a couple YouTube tutorials later, I was ready to make my first template. I started by scaling my model first. The original Inferno Lamp in game is about six feet tall, and we don't have that kind of room for that. So I wanted to scale it down to something a little more manageable. So I measured out a spot in my wall and got an idea of what would work. I believe the end result was somewhere around three feet wide and tall when you count the horns. Once I had what I wanted, it came time to split the model up. I only needed one side of the model to make the template, the other half could just be inverted later on. So I only focused on half of the model when splitting everything up. I split the model in sections based on what I felt would result in decent template pieces. Once I was happy with what I had, I unfolded the model. Once unfolded, Peppacora automatically lays all the pieces out for you. But I obviously don't need all those pieces. Everything on the bad half of the 3D model, I shoved into a corner for later. And once I had the template laid out all nice and organized, I took the scrap pieces from the bad half and chucked them up in the top left corner. Peppacora only lays out more sheets of paper when placing pieces to the right or below of the initial first page, so the top left corner is a great place to put off your scraps to save paper. Uh, in case anybody wants to also try building this, um, I'll try to share the Peppacora file somewhere online. I don't know where as of right now, but I'll make sure I put a link in the description. If anyone watching this knows a good place to upload Peppacora files, mention it in the comments and I'll do my best to upload it there. And if I can, I'll put that link in the description as well. Once the template was ready, I converted it to PDF and printed it all out to cardstock. When I'm dealing with templates, I always build a paper template first. No template is going to be perfect, especially when you take into consideration your printer's limitations and your settings. So building a template first lets you double check on all that to make sure everything is okay. It's also a good practice run too to get an idea of where some of the bends are and how to approach them.
Sable's favorite part of a build is the template assembly. Cats are supposed to hate tape, but for some reason, this goofball loves painter's tape. Once I had assembled the template, I had a few support pieces inside to kind of help prevent the model from collapsing in on itself, and to give the horns a little extra support. With the template assembled in cardstock, there are a few spots here and there that I felt needed adjusted so that assembly would go easier. And then I drew over the edges of those pieces with black magic marker to make sure I wouldn't miss any of those fixes. And at this point, I created all of my alignment markings for a lot of the bigger pieces, like the horns. And now we're ready to translate that all to foam. Everything in this build would use my usual cosplay supplies, which is EVA foam. But where should I get my supplies this time? I cannot think of a better craft store that would be glad, dare I say, honored to be the sole supplier of materials for a project dedicated to the icon of fire, the elemental of flame. The avatar of all things hot and burning. Then Hobby Lobby. I believe this project will fit right in with their customer demographic. Okay, so all jokes aside, uh, when I started cosplaying about like eight years ago, um, I started out by actually using Hobby Lobby's sheet foam, but I had stopped using it years ago once I found better options online. It wasn't until recently when I was at a cosplay friend's house, we were talking about materials and the discussion of foam clay had come up and he had mentioned that Hobby Lobby now sells foam clay and I was completely unaware of this and he said that yeah that they had updated their regular foam section and into a small cosplay section. So out of curiosity I had to go check it out and they did in fact have a cosplay section. I mean it was tiny but the same size you would see at Michael's, but they had everything I needed for this project. Uh, at, at the time, the foam clay wasn't in stock at my store, so I had to order that online. But that said, this foam clay, worth four dollars. That is a steal in comparison. This is Michael's foam clay, and it's seventeen dollars. And this stuff is garbage. So you're damn right. I'm gonna give this stuff a try. So, the ground rules were set. All foam was going to be supplied by Hobby Lobby. We had 10mm foam, 5mm foam, 3mm foam, translucent foam, and foam clay. Time to craft. From here, the pieces can pretty much be assembled in any order, just as long as you keep in mind what's connecting to what and at what angles. I started with the base, being the support for the whole structure, I built it out of 10mm foam to help keep it a little more sturdy. I carefully removed the base from the template and started separating the front, back, and sides. On black foam, I used a silver sharpie to outline my templates so it's easier to see. And for every piece I traced, I made sure to flip the template and trace it again for the other side of the prop. For the front portion of the base, I gave myself a little extra room where the mouth will connect to the base. This will give me more contact room, and the traced outline will later give me a more accurate spot to follow when lining up the mouth. For the sides, I kept track of what number order each piece went in and what angle cuts I would need to get the desired bend. For example, 45 degree angle is achieved by one straight edge and one angle cut. 
and a 90 degree angle is achieved by two angle cuts. Once all the pieces are cut, came time to glue it all together with some contact cement. Let it air dry for a few minutes, and then press it all together. and the base was done. Next came the horns. From here, I switched everything to five millimeter foam. The horns being so big, the weight reduction was ideal. Plus, because of the point they come to at the end, 10 millimeter foam would have been very difficult to handle at the tips. I traced out all eight strips for the horns to foam twice, including the alignment marks. Because of the horn shape, I could have gotten away with straight cuts all along to get them properly round. But because of the texture of the scales around the horns, I went with a 45 degree for each seam. So every strip has a straight cut on the left and an angle cut on the right. And to make things look more symmetrical, on the other horn, I inverted that and made a straight cut on the right and an angle cut on the left. This 45 degree approach makes assembling the horns a little more difficult because it has eight sides. And a 45 degree angle wants to close in on itself at four pieces. I did this though because the end result will pull the edges flat on the horns, matching the polygonal structure of the model. The end result looked pretty decent. Once those were done, came time to build the rest of Ifrit's head, starting with the crown and working my way down, carefully cutting out sections from the cardstock template and doing one small piece at a time and flipping the template to make the left and right side at the same time. This model gets very complicated with the face. This is why I only work in small sections at a time. To help me keep track of my angle cuts, I have my Pipacora template open on my computer, and I take multiple photos of those pieces, and then I reference them as often as needed. If you take note of my phone on the table, you can see me referencing those photos. As mentioned before on the base, once the mouth was ready to be pressed onto the base, I was able to align the outside of the trace lines to ensure both the left and right were even. And once the mouth was in, I finished off with a flat piece of 10mm foam inside the mouth, which in hindsight I should have done before attaching the mouth to the base, 
but I managed. And from there, I hit the whole thing with the Dremel tool to get rid of any rough edges and seams that I could find. The trim on the base isn't included in the 3D model, because the trim in game is a baked in texture, so I had to freehand this part. For the sides, I used the pre-existing template pieces and drew out the trimming design on that. I transferred this to 5mm foam and then cut it out. There is a recession in the trim on the sides, so I made sure to include that in a template as well, so that when the time came to attach the pieces to the sides, that middle piece could help hold a straight line. For the front portion of the base, I covered it first in painter's tape. Then using reference images on my phone, I drew out the trimming. Once drawn, I transferred the tape to 3mm foam and cut out both sides. and then attach the trim to the base. Up next would be the detailing phase, but before I could do that, I needed to put in the lighting. I got this lighting kit from Walmart's website. It's battery powered and remote controlled. I'll leave a link in the description for this, but I did notice that mine was slightly defective. For some reason, yellow showed up green. Even though all three colors lit up in the diodes, for some reason it could not produce a yellow. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, but I managed to just work with it. I started by building a base for the light in the mouth by using some old leftover white foam from some old Hobby Lobby sheets that I had. I wanted to use white foam so that the LEDs would have something to reflect better off of. And from there, I started cutting access holes in the back. Originally, I also wanted the teeth on the base to light up, hence the holes that you see me cut out now. But after some testing, I didn't have anywhere near enough LED strip to get the desired lighting that I wanted. So I opted out of that and just went with the mouth, eyes, and crown. This was fine though, because that's what lights up on the base model of the Inferno lamp. There is a deluxe version of the Inferno Lamp in game called a Blazing Inferno Lamp, and in that version, the teeth on the base and the horns also light up. And I was just going for the base Inferno Lamp, so this was fine. While running the LED strip through the prop, I had two main goals. One, have the LED receiver be front and center inside the mouth so that it could be easily read from the remote. And two, have the battery pack be easily accessible from behind to change batteries. Interestingly enough, the LED receiver can't be read behind a single sheet of EVA foam, but it can be read behind several sheets of transparent foam. All that was left was to find a good route for the LED strip to travel inside the head and out the mouth and then glue it in place. Once I had this strip glued in the mouth, I took a piece of transparent foam and glued it over top to diffuse the lighting. I knew this wasn't going to be enough lighting for the mouth, so I took the very end of the strip and brought it back through the mouth one more time to get a little bit extra lighting down the center, and then glued it in place. From there, I made an enclosure inside the head to contain the rest of the LED strips lighting inside the upper portion of the head. I do apologize that this footage doesn't show it that well, but it more or less cuts off anywhere for that light to escape outside from behind the eyes in the opening in the crown. Once that was all in, 
came time to finish the enclosure for the light in the mouth. I took the mouth light template from before and made it out of transparent foam. And then, referencing the in-game model, I used the paper template and drew out the design for the stained glass trimming. Once that was done, I transferred that to 2mm foam twice for depth. Once I was all glued together, I glued that around the white foam base that I had made inside the mouth and pressed it all into place. Uh, in hindsight, this wasn't the best approach. And if I could do it again, I'd use clear plastic instead with the transparent foam inside to diffuse the lighting. Um, the seam down the center of the foam is just way too noticeable. But anyway, once the LEDs were all in place and taken care of, I was able to close the back up again, using some contact cement and some painter's tape to hold it all into place until it dried. I did it this way because if I let it dry first, I wouldn't have been able to get the pieces to line up well together afterwards because of the instant bond that contact cement has. This was a much easier method and it would never be seen anyway but it still closed up pretty good. By now you've probably seen a 3D model of some flames in the crown periodically. So let's talk about that real quick. Inside of Ifrit's crown is a small flame. It is called an inferno lamp after all. I searched across thingiverse.com again and found several flame models. This model in particular caught my eye because of the unique dimensions that it had. I placed the 3D model in my slicer program for my printer I made adjustments to what I thought would fit inside the crown and let it print overnight while working on previous steps. It was set to its default 20% infill and I selected a tree root support structure because I hadn't used it before and I thought it'd be neat. Long story short, this model didn't work that well. Aside from the fact that I broke it in about three different spots, it also didn't fit inside the crown and wasn't illuminating as much as I wanted either. So aside from the fact that I needed to make the model a little more narrow, on the second print attempt, I also made the infill 10%, which is basically zero internal structure. There was no breakage on the second attempt, and it did fit well inside the crown, but we'll see that later. And from here, we finally get to talk about detailing with foam clay. So let's talk about clay real quick for a second. I've used several brands by now, um, from real top tier stuff, mid tier, the whole way down to the bottom with stuff like Model Magic. And this foam clay was the deciding factor for all of my supplies from Hobby Lobby. Now, if you saw my previous series on building a Black Templar crossplay from Warhammer 40k, um, throughout like the nine hours of video in that series, you'll see me just come. I just hate on this stuff so much. Um, this container is seventeen dollars, and every one that I have had so far has been dried out. Now. You could just say that I had a bad batch when I was doing this, but I went through at least four of these containers and every single one was dry. This isn't a Michaels video, but I, I just want to just, for example, just I, I'm, I'm pulling. This is what 
That's Michael's phone clip. The fact alone that this was three dollars, well, three ninety nine, was ridiculous. And in all honesty, I was kind of expecting like model magic quality levels out of this. And no, holy crap, this is amazing stuff. It's look at this. It's super fluffy, okay? I've had this container open for like at least a week now, and this is still how it is with the lid closed. I mean, this, look at that. <laughs> Quality stuff, garbage, $4, $17. Buy this, don't buy this. But yeah, this stuff is super fluffy. It bonds to EVA foam so easily. And the best part is the drying time. So foam clay is normally about a 48 hour dry time. But um, the initial starting dry time on this is probably a couple hours. Might just be from my own personal experience, but this gives you so much time to work with it before it starts to dry on you. like. Um, not even kidding, while I was using this, um, I left the lid open and I just pulled out what I needed, worked, and what was in here wasn't even drying out. Neither was what I was working with. By like 24 hours, it's dry, but like, you usually want to wait that whole 48 hours for everything to really be dry. But <laughs> it's good stuff. I can't even just describe how good this stuff is um i kind of hate to even tell everyone how good it is because once the word gets out um either one or two things is going to happen one it's going to sell out or two price will go up one of the two or probably both but if you ever want to get into messing with foam clay go to hobby lobby this is four dollars I, I cannot recommend it enough yeah but anyway, back to the build. I started out with the underside of the horns, measuring out the space for the scale pattern as evenly as I could on both sides. And then rolling foam clay into dowels, I pressed it into those spots underneath the horns. I wasn't super worried about this being seamless because I was going to go over it all later with quick seal to fill it all in. So as long as the basic shape was down, that was fine. From there I started inside the mouth to fill in a couple of gaps I had from installing the mouth lights. Originally this was going to be the most I was going to do with the face. Fix a couple spots here and there, add some details to the roof of the mouth, and then just spend the rest of the time on the horns. But the more I used this, the more comfortable with it I became, and let's just say I got a little out of control and decided to cover the entire face with foam clay. But this turned out to be an excellent decision because it allowed me to add some extra details to the face. I would call it a happy accident, but it was more like I was just enjoying myself way too much to stop. I only applied a thin layer of foam clay to the face, just enough to smooth things out. Any more than that, and the face would get too bulky and become unrecognizable.
I did this process over two days. The second day was the scales on the top of the horns. By this time, the foam on the face was already dry to the touch, but still needed to settle for another 24 hours. I had done the same process to the top of the horns that I had done underneath by measuring out and marking where the scales would be so that things would be somewhat even. And from there, I started applying foam clay for the scales. Because the scales overlap, I started at the tips of the horns and worked my way down, bouncing back and forth between the horns to make sure everything stayed kind of consistent. That and so I wouldn't get burnt out as easily. If I finished one horn before the other, I'd probably want to take a break. But if I drew them both out, bouncing back and forth, I could stay focused on the goal of getting them both done, because I wouldn't want to leave the horns sit unfinished. Plus, there was a chance that I might run out of foam clay before I finished the horns, and this would give me a good idea of keeping track of how much supply I had left. Fortunately, somehow, I had just enough foam clay to finish the horns. Seriously, I missed like one scale on the back of the horns right behind the head. You wouldn't see it anyway, but that's how close I had come from running out. And from there, I let the foam clay dry for two days, and then came time to start detailing the face. I took a silver marker and started marking where all the scar tissue would be on Ifrit's face. His little scales on his nose, his wrinkles, you name it. And that's when I brought out my Dremel tool. I didn't want to do this after the foam had dried so nice and smooth, but I went for it anyway and did a few passes with different Dremel bits and cut his face up. It wasn't pretty to look at, and I was kind of scared of what I had done to it. Did I mess it up? Was I going to have to go back and fix it all? Nah, the ridiculous amount of quick seal I put on this made it look great. This was an insanely messy process. I wore rubber gloves for the whole thing. Pretty much all I did was lay down a disgusting amount of quick seal, got my hands real wet, and just rubbed that stuff everywhere. Well, except for the transparent foam, don't want to do that. It was probably a bit overkill, but it got the job done. And then I let all this sit overnight and got it ready for the next day to be primed and painted. I used some painter's tape and taped off everything that lights up, being the mouth, the eyes, and the crown. I did this with the lights turned on, so I could see what I was taping up a little bit easier. The next day, I took effort outside and hung them up on my painting rack, that being a cheap clothes hanger from Walmart. I moved it all the way to the backyard so I wouldn't get overspray on anything and went to town on the prop. I only had one can of Plasti Dip in the house, so I had to make it count. I did my best to give it an even coat all over and then just kept going with light coats until I ran out of paint. I believe I got it all pretty good. Once back inside, I removed the painter's tape from inside the mouth, eyes, and crown, and checked out my new 3D printed fire for the crown. It lit up pretty good, so I set it aside in a safe place so I wouldn't break it. And from there, I realized I made a goof. I forgot to make the crown's detailing before sealing and priming. So I used some painter's tape and covered the existing crown and traced its edges. When I'd used my foam clay on the face, it kind of elevated the face to be flush with the crown. And not only do I want the crown to be higher than the face, but it also needed trim. So with my crown template traced, I transferred it to two millimeter EVA foam four times for the left and right, both the inner and outer layers. And once all four pieces are cut, I hollowed out the top layer to make the trim. I then glued them together and then glued them onto the crown. 
two millimeter foam is kind of forgiving. It'll stretch a decent amount to give you the play that you need, which is how I approached it here. I started by placing it in the front and slowly aligned everything on the left and right as I wrapped it around, pulling and tugging everything to make it line up where I needed it to, all until I lined it up perfectly in the back. Once that was all done, I could go back to hand painting. The crown wouldn't have any sealer or primer on it, but it was kind of too late. And I probably should have gone back and done it, but it's just a home project. I started by giving the whole thing a black base coat. If I remember right, this was the same metallic clear black that I had used to fix some highlights on my Black Templar costume in my previous video. It did give everything a little bit of a shine, but I needed to cover up all the inconsistencies from the prime not reaching everything evenly. I do believe I gave it two passes, just to make sure that I got everything. Once it had dried, it came time for color. The base and the crown are silver with gold trimming. I used the same style metallic paints, starting with the silver as a base coat. Once that was all dry, I moved on to the trim on the base with a metallic gold. With the base all done, it came time for the fun part of painting the face. To make sure I got it right, I grabbed every red and brown I had in the basement and started mixing colors. I started with the darkest colors first. With black being the base coat, my first coat would be a dark red, covering the majority of the face except for the deepest and darkest spots. It was kind of hard to see, so I made sure I used my phone's flashlight to help me out. On the next pass, I mixed a slightly lighter red color, hitting only the high points. That way you could see a transition from the three colors, black, dark red, and red. This red does look very bright on camera, much brighter than the in-game model. But keep in mind, I have a lot of lighting while painting, so I can see. So the paint isn't as bright as it seems. And then I did the same thing with the horns. A dark brown brushing over only the high points, leaving the dark spots alone.
and then mixing a lighter brown and hitting only the very topmost spots, leaving behind an even transition between the three colors, black, dark brown, and light brown. Once those were both done, I made one more mix of paint just for highlights. This was a pinkish color using both browns and reds, and I watered it down a lot and only applied it to the very highest points, or in some cases, using it to highlight stuff like wrinkles and edges. And we're all done. This is the finished Inferno lamp. Um, I apologize, I left the uh, remote control upstairs. So I cannot guarantee what color this is gonna show up to when I turn it on in the back. Right now we're blue, I guess we're gonna be blue. Um, but yeah. I'd probably have to turn off some extra lighting to really show off the lights here better. But you can kind of get the gist of it. The horns in the top light up blue. Mouth lights up blue. Eyes light up blue. They light up. Um, they, the remote changes to whatever colors I want. Things to talk about. Um, well, first off, the probably the biggest disappointment is the mouth. Um, I mentioned it already. If I could redo this, I would. Um, there's a dip right here. You can see that. Um, I have absolutely no idea how that happened. I tried to fix it, I tried to repair it, and it still just pops right out. Also, the, the seam down the center, it's very apparent. If I was to do it again, if I could, I would definitely do the mouth differently. I would. Um, Probably use plastic or something like that, like a clear plastic, and then just use the uh, translucent foam inside to diffuse the lighting. That would have been a much better approach than what we actually used. Um, let's see. The detailing on the horns, though, I really am happy with how this turned out, especially since I haven't used foam clay to this extent before. Um, the most I had used in the past, I mean, I've used a lot of foam clay, but not so much like actually like modeling, modeling, mostly making molds. So, for example, like the skulls and the pauldrons for my two Warhammer suits, that was foam clay. Um, a lot of like the skulls and details on the sister battle suit here, foam clay. But I've never done any actual like sculpting and like clay work. And I'm insanely happy with how this turned out, especially these horns. We'll look in the back here real quick, just kind of give an idea of how this all works. So this is just an access hole in the bottom here. This is where the uh, battery pack is. It just lays in there. All nice tucked away. Never took the tape off. I probably should. Ah, good enough. And then I cut out a small spot here in the top center. And that's just where the wall hook goes. Um, it's kind of like a regular clothes hanger. And then I just pop it up on there. Whole thing hangs. Easy to put on the wall, easy to take off. So, only thing left to do, I guess, is to take it upstairs and put it on the wall. Thanks for watching. Um, I wanted to put in a little extra effort for this video because um, 
as of right now recording i'm inching insanely close to a thousand subscribers um if by the time this comes out i'll either be at it or be very close so i wanted to make this video a little special uh hence all the animations um i'm saying this all before the animations are all done so i'm kind of hoping that <laughs> kind of hoping that the work paid off but if you like what you saw i highly recommend following me on facebook or instagram um, those can be the most up-to-date places on my projects that I update. Um, usually they're up to date to the day of where I'm at on a project and all that other stuff. Um, video editing takes a while, so this, these videos tend to come out way after the fact. So if you do like following projects, I recommend following me there for that stuff. Um, let's see, as far as this thing goes, um, I'll give a real quick history on this Dragoon helmet. I don't know what you call this, like bonus material, I guess. So back around the beginning of 2020, end of 2019, I started working on my next cosplay, which is going to be for the 2020 convention season. And it was going to be a Dragoon. Um, as far as Dragoons go, this was my dream cosplay. Um, before I even knew what cosplay was back in like the early 2000s, I wanted to make a Dragoon costume. Um, I had, before Final Fantasy XIV, I was a heavy Final Fantasy XI player, and I played Dragoon exclusively. Uh, <laughs> I could get into a whole video about that. But I was so in love with the Dragoon class that I wanted to make Dragoon armor. I didn't know how or anything like that, but it was a dream of mine. And that had stayed with me until I had actually gotten into cosplay. And it has always been a goal of mine to make Dragoon armor. So why is it unfinished? You heard the, the, the date that I mentioned I was doing this, right? 2020. About two months into the project, maybe three months, two and a half months, um, COVID hit and everything got shut down. And I was also using this as a means of losing weight. So I was probably down 20 pounds and I was going to keep losing weight as the project went. And eventually I was going to hit my weight goal by the time I had finished building the suit and come convention time I would have been in decent enough shape to wear the suit. Uh, 2020 hit, everyone stayed home, gained it all back, didn't do any exercise. Then the convention season got pushed back until like the next two years. So the whole suit sat. Eventually all the armor got thrown out except for the helmet. Um, I had shoulders, chest, uh, I think I was starting the boots, had some of the gloves done, but this is happening again. I don't know when, if it'll be next year or the year after, but this is still my dream costume and I am not going to stop cosplaying until I get this guy done. Um, I will most likely redo the whole helmet, make the whole thing again. This was entirely done from scratch. But again, thanks for watching. Uh, I have more projects lined up. Not this. Uh, for Halloween. So I'm not doing any announcements until it actually gets rolling. If you actually do want to see where I'm at, follow me on Facebook or Instagram. Those can be the first two places you'll start seeing stuff. So I got crap to work on. I'll see you in the next one.